slid into the one of the back rows when Gerald was here, and uh, I'm from Minnesota, so as far as I'm concerned, he spent a week in God's country, and uh, was helping some friends out in Rochester, and so I'm privileged to stand in here this morning. Jay called me a couple weeks ago and asked if I would be available to come up here, and um, as soon as I get my Bible, I'll be ready to do that. Hey, I'm with you this morning. I got up when it was a little cool, and uh, for a Minnesota boy like me, I thought this is some wonderful mid-July weather, you know, uh, a bit of an exaggeration. I grew up thinking and believing I was German and Norwegian all my life, 50-50, and then I found out last year I've got 10 to 15 percent of Russian in me. So the acclimating myself to this heat at times is a bit of a challenge. So, uh, um, but we moved down here eight years ago, and uh, we have thoroughly enjoyed our time. And we have plugged into Brentwood Baptist. And uh, I'm a pastor in ministry, but when we got here, we brought my in-laws, my wife's parents in with us who were in very great uh, physical need, and uh, my wife is an amazing entrepreneur and bakes a mean cake, but I'm probably the master of our kitchen, and so we said, you know what, I'll stay home, she'll, uh, she'll provide in the amazing way she does with her business, and um, so I would stay home, I took care of them and managed the home and cook our meals, do the shopping, and then I would do guest preaching, and then I did some, uh, some other part-time ministry. And um, one of the things that I've done in the last couple of years is be trained to and to be a transitional interim pastor. And uh, I've worked with planters. I've been asked to plant. I've been on staffs of churches that grew from plants. I support sit planting. I sit in every month with a group of planters in the city. But there's something about working with churches that know they are in a place that they want to move on from and they're challenged in. That's what broke my heart and called me. And so I've been privileged to serve in three churches in the last three years in various states of that journey. And I just want to affirm you because I'll be honest, I've preached in dozens of churches throughout the Nashville area and all of them uh, are not in a place that they want to, not many of them are not, but to seek help and resources, as you can imagine, is a difficult thing to do. And so I just really want to affirm and encourage you in your working and partnering with Jay and Brentwood Baptist. And um, I listened to Gerald. It is Gerald, right? Your pastor? Yes. And uh, last week, and he talked about the excitement here in the future. And um, so, again, I'm just really grateful for you leaning in and accepting that help because there's a legacy here that's going to continue in College Grove because of God's breath of life through you, right? Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful thing to get up on a stunning day like this and call out to you in praise and honor and glory. You are worthy of all that we just sang and much more. And our hearts are inclined to give that to you today. Yes, we have in song. Now I speak your hand upon my heart and my words now that I would impress them upon these willing and loving saints of yours to hear them and move in the strength that only you can buy. Amen. Well, my kids give me a hard time if we go out once in a while and we're in the mall or walking around town somewhere. I tend to get in conversations fairly easily. And um, They'll, they'll kid me about that. And one of the things I like to do, uh, not always just on the street, but when I'm talking to people, is find out what their favorite things are. If you ask somebody what their favorite restaurant is, you're immediately probably going to see someone slip into a conversation. Let me see. I like this place. I like that. Maybe their favorite vacation destination. Back when we used to dress up, we'd, I'd ask pastors what was their favorite tie. Uh, we don't wear those anymore, except if it's for a wedding, a wedding or a funeral. But um, it's an interesting thing to ask people what their favorite is. What's their favorite movie? We had a great little conversation in our life group the other night talking about some of the movies that have inspired and spoken to us. What about a favorite verse? 
you probably have one or maybe more favorite verses. Sometimes we call that a life verse, right? And why do we have a life verse? Because there's a moment in our life where we intersected with the truth of God's word in a way, and he moved us, he met us. There was a need that he touched through those words. And we've retained the impact and importance of that. We have a life verse, a favorite verse. And I have my friends, I have what I call a dirty Bible. I write and scribble and make stars and arrows in it all the time. I hope you do. And my friends who have favorite verses, I've underlined and noted there. The Apostle Paul was a pretty interesting guy. All you have to do is take a look at his work just briefly, and it, we sat in our life group together, and I just humbled at what he was called to do and what he did. Do you think he had a favorite verse? This man who was charged by God to basically pen almost all of the New Testament for us wrote many, many amazing, powerful things that the Lord gave. And yet I would assert that I think he probably had a favorite verse. Now, if we go out to dinner, my wife will look for a blue burger at a restaurant. I love blue cheese, so does she, and she loves that combination. And she didn't have to tell me, but I realized after a few of those events, that's probably one of her favorite foods, the blue burger. And so I wondered what Paul's favorite verse was. Now, we could sit and talk like, okay, what was Paul's favorite meal or what was his favorite robe or type of sandal? I guess that'd be some interesting trivia we'd never really come to agreement on. But I'm going to assert to you, I believe he had a favorite verse. And yet I'm going to tell you that he never said it was his favorite. How could I stand in front of you and make such a claim? Because he said it all the time. If somebody does something and chooses something in a moment of free opportunity for them all the time, you'd probably say it's their favorite. So some of you are spinning right now and going, okay, what does Paul say twice, three times, four times? He said it all. He wrote it all the time. And if you've got your Bible with you today or a phone, you could open up to Galatians chapter 1. Or you could go to Ephesians or Colossians or Philippians or First and Second Thessalonians. You could go to Titus. You could go to Timothy. Why? Because he says this in every one of his letters. What am I talking about? Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You might say, Tom, come on, man, that's his greeting. I'm going to spend some time with you this morning, and I hope to persuade you that this was not ever intended to be a greeting. It's far more than that. It became an opening and a greeting, if you will, but it's far, far, far more far more than that. Now it's interesting to look at the process that Paul followed when he would, again, it's, I'm sure everybody probably knows, but the man, his birth name was what? Saul, okay? A stunning man of intellect, it seems. He tells us he was nothing physically, probably a small, at the end of his life, unfortunately, somewhat stooped over given all the horror that he'd gone through. But, his name is Saul, and he is a rising star in the Pharisaic Jewish community. He attended Gamaliel School, which is probably one of the top two rabbinical schools in the entire world, and he was, boom, number one. And he was so noted for what he did and what he understood in Scripture that the Pharisees saw an enterprising man and said, we want you to help us take care of them, meaning the way early Christians. And so he became really the enforcer. And if you've read through the book of Acts, which I'm sure many of you have, you know that he was there when they stoned Stephen. 
He was called to do what? To oppress, to harass, to arrest, to beat, to terrorize, and yes, kill the early believers. In it, he had a supernatural conversion. Are there any other kind? <laughs> Is there any other kind of conversion but a supernatural one? He met the presence of Jesus, and he was broken and came to the light that, in the revelation that Jesus afforded him, and he then was called to what? Share the salvific plan and presence of Jesus in the life of every believer who would claim and take that faith, right? And so it was a very interesting process he would follow because the synagogue were the key opportunity for him. Now, the synagogue came out of the dispersion of Judah. The ten northern tribes had been taken away and dispersed by Assyria. Babylon came and then brought many of the Judaites over and emplaced them into their culture. But the temple was gone and the sacrificial system was taken out. Did I just fix my sound? Am I coming through? Okay. I'm okay? Thank you. So what they would do is they read the scrolls because they, why were they taken away? They'd left God. They'd moved away from him. Well, then they began to read, and they developed that into what became the synagogue. And in the synagogue, a rabbi would stand up, open the scroll, and read from the Old Testament. And then those people that were qualified, if you had credentials, you could comment on it. And I see a couple wonderful men and women here who have, I think, credentials of maturity and insight in the word that you could come up and comment. And so Paul, because he'd been to that school, was afforded the opportunity, but he flipped the switch, didn't he? Because he's not talking about the coming Messiah, but the one who came, the Nazarene, the carpenter's son, the man that they would kill. And then out of that, he would get a small portion, generally, of people interested, and there would be conversions, and he would set up these house churches, and then he would send these letters. Now, the letters would be penned and written by him. He'd put a seal on it, and he'd hire a courier to walk, maybe ride, perhaps take a boat ride, and deliver these letters. And they'd open it up, and within the first couple verses, they'd see this phrase, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And they go, man, that is really good because I went to school and I had to learn how to write letters and it's really polite to start your letters like that. Did you know that Paul, in a sense, disappeared into Arabia for a few years? If you go back to the beginning of Galatians, you'll see this little tiny verse inserted where it talks about Paul disappearing and going into Arabia, and he was mentored by the presence of Jesus Christ, resurrected Christ. What do you think? They stood around saying, now, Paul, we got to, because when you leave, they're going to go astray. Yeah, they are. And when you leave, they're going to get into trouble. Yeah, and when you leave, they're going to sin. They're going to set up problems. we got to come up with a good, good letter. And so when we send it back, we can keep them on track. What if we go, dear people of do you think they struggled with that? No. What Jesus said is, because of my grace, you have been given peace. That has got to be on your lips. That has got to be on the very face of your presence. And every time you write them, it's the first thing. That's it. Because up till then, it was all math. What do I mean? Let's see if I do this and I don't do this and I do that again and not this. But if I do that and I do this twice, then I'm good. Maybe you live that way. I know people who still do. Bad the nation of Israel was given, obviously, a plan and a covenant through God, but they'd moved from it. And now, after the dispersion of the northern and southern kingdoms, and the Pharisees in their culture, they had added rule upon rule onto the law, the law, the word of God. And so they had all these different things to avoid or to do and do in this way or do at that time. 
And Jesus came back in his new name. One sacrifice, one decision, one life of salvation through that one faith in you. And that's what Paul has charged us. You know that. That's what this church has done for generations. Live and share that, right? I had, I'm going to admit to you, I had skipped over those verses for years. Guys, I'm a pastor. I preached hundreds of times, I don't know, almost 500 times. And I, I open and I read my Bible a lot. And I generally would start about verse 6, 7, or 8. Because there's a little greeting up front, and I want to get to the good stuff. It's good stuff. This was never intended to be the polite way to open a letter. This was a revelation. This was mind-blowing change of God to give salvation through what? Simply the sacrifice and brokenness of his son to then own that in faith. And so I see a figurative paradigm here because my life has radically been changed when I came to that realization. And I think putting this in front of every letter, it's that window that if you don't read that, or at least remind yourself of that grace and truth, everything else in the rest of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians is just going to lack power. Because everything behind it comes out of His grace. Romans 3.23, a verse that I'm sure that many of you know. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace. By His grace. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Grace, in, in a sense, is the conduit through which the love and the, and the initiative of Jesus and through the Father came and was offered to us. I think someday we'll be in heaven, and I wonder if there'll be a visible representation of grace. Can't wait. Ephesians 3, 8, and 9, For it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works. Grace. I don't have to try. You don't have to try to avoid, to do Anybody do something like that when you came to faith? I don't know if you were six, seven, eight. You know what? It was 34 years ago today that I came to faith. October 8, 1989. And my eyes were opened up to the reality of that greeting because God greeted me. That's what it was. And I accepted that. What about Peter? Well, this is fast. This is fast. There are times I'm more motivated than others in seasons of my life to look at the Psalms. But you don't have to look a whole lot to find the struggle, the challenge of life written within the Psalms. And David and the other authors who penned them spoke often about the inevitability, the tension, the chaos in their hearts. There wasn't peace calling out and seeking God to answer his people. And then amazingly, in Ezekiel, God called another seemingly ordinary man to say that I'm going to give you a covenant of peace. Radical change. I'm going to give you a covenant of peace prophesied by Ezekiel. David knew he was not at peace. He sought that. He knew that there was a tension. He knew he sought the Lord's heart, and there was still that covenant. And yet, God had a plan here to move ahead and secure a peace eternally within. And Ezekiel is the first guy to introduce that covenant. 
And Paul even talks about it in Colossians. He talks about being alienated and apart from God. And some of you have probably seen or drawn a picture where you have a, a person on a chasm here and a cliff, and there's a gap in between. You can't get across unless the cross is there as you walk through to the provision of Jesus Christ. So again, he's talking about that lack of peace without faith in Jesus. And then get this. Luke chapter 1. Angel appears, if you recall, twice, right? Before the angel came to Mary, who did it go to? Zechariah. In the temple. And said, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah. Come on, man. Do you know, you got the wrong guy. You know how old I am? You know what? You're going to be mute until he's born. And that son was who? John the Baptist. You ever watch The Chosen? What does Peter call him? Preach John. <laughs> I don't know. If you ran around in a fur cloak and ate grasshoppers, maybe you'd seem pretty creepy. But he's an amazing guy. But what did Zechariah say when his tongue was loosed? Upon the birth of John, he will usher us into and prepare for us a time and a path of, what do you think? Peace. Peace. So we see peace prophesied by Ezekiel, and now we have Zechariah as John, the precursor and preparer for Jesus. His father saying that is going to define his ministry. And then what did the angel sing tonight, people? Glory to God in the highest. And peace, whoa, was that just some carol they picked out? Because you know, there's five or six we should pick from that first set tonight. Should we do this one, girls, guys? No. We got to think about peace because it's here now. We've been talking about it since Ezekiel hundreds of years ago. Oh, man, peace. John 14, Jesus is kind of freaking out the Tell them, you know, I, I'm going to leave. Well, where are you going? And they're, they're tense. You, can, you could just take a look at John 14. You could just see it. And Jesus says, I'm going to leave you with my peace. And then in Acts 10, probably the second most important sermon in that, in that book. After Pentecost, Peter stands and if you recall, he was given a vision, and a sheet came down, and it was a, a figurative image to tell him to allow the unclean, yes, and the Gentiles into the family of God. And as he went to a Gentile's house, Cornelius, he gave a sermon. And he said that God had sent them to the people of Israel, but telling the good news of peace through Christ to the Gentiles also. Paul, in multiple, con multiple moments throughout his epistles, speaks of being, Romans 5.1, justified through faith. He has peace. And then in Ephesians 6, the famous armor of God, which is all set up so that we could avoid, what, the flaming arrows of the enemy. And yet as we talk about the helmet, the sword, the breastplate, feet fitted, what, with the gospel of peace. That means it's really, initi really initiating a charge. This is fascinating. We're at tension with God without Christ. Ezekiel prophesies to him. Zechariah says John the Baptist is going to prepare a path of peace. The angels proclaim it. Jesus speaks of it. Peter and Paul do. And then even here in Ephesians 6 with that armor to withstand what? Attacks? I am given the gospel of peace in my feet, in sense to charge and move and share this. Why wouldn't Paul write this in every letter? How could he not? How could he not? I'll never forget. I, I have been so blessed to have seen the northern lights hundreds of times, dozens. Has anybody seen the Northern Lights here? There you go. There, and you've probably seen them now depicted, but it's it's kind.
kind of a greenish, white, greenish, yellowish kind of wave on the horizon. Just Now, I have seen it over and over and over, usually in the spring. I grew up in a small town, uh, Parker's Prairie, 884 people. And in our little neighborhood, there were about eight, ten guys, and we would play basketball, football, baseball. And we had a game called Scout. And basically, it's hide-and-seek with teams. Okay, And we would run around all night our neighborhood and play scout and we just it was every night it was just a blast well we're out one night and we see something in the sky now every one of us had seen the northern lights many times but this is different it actually started to spin and turn red there was a red vortex if you will in the heavens above us I would never have believed this if I hadn't seen it myself. I was probably 14 years old. And we looked around and said, we got to tell everybody. So we ran over to the Eden Lot, the Cyberts, the Gapas, the Carlsons. You got to get out of here. You got to see this. And we're all standing out in the street. Holy smoke. See this. I'm not kidding. Red swirling in the heavens, the northern light. We had to tell them. Great. And so Paul had to say, that's what he's charged to do. It totally redefined his present life and his eternity in every one of ours. This wasn't a greeting. This is a proclamation. This is an announcement. This is stunning stuff. There's a uh, two kinds of peace that we can experience. Clearly one is the peace that we have with God because that sin has been taken away. But out of that reservoir of peace, we can also tap into a sense of calm and direction in times of difficulty. And I don't think I'd say something that you don't know to say that in the last three and a half to four years, there's been a sense of stress and tension in our world that I don't recall in my life. Now, all I have to do is go back and look at the book of Judges or elsewhere in the Old Testament or even here in the New Testament and find that people lived under tension and stress frequently. And I think about my parents and the Depression and guys I'd known who walked through the war. and We were certainly blessed with a, a modicum of peace. But these last three years, I have seen and experienced moments of stress and tension. My wife and I at times where I just, and I hit my knees, and I speak this. This is a really easy verse to memorize. Grace and peace to you, through God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I seek to be fulfilled in that, to do what I can to exemplify, to, to encourage that, to implement that peace. Now, there may be an enterprising student of the Bible here who's saying, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, Tom. In Matthew, Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace. Let me address that really quickly. Matthew was probably one of the strangest of the disciples because he truly was a government official for the empire of the Ro Roman Empire, dropped into this group of 12, he really came a long way out of the world view to get into that. And if you take a look at his gospel, what it opens with Herod killing the boys in Bethlehem. And a death threat to Mary and Joseph, they wanted to kill the baby. And there are other violent depictions and phrases even used by Jesus talking prophetically. It is one of the most violently contextual gospels of those four. And so what Jesus is saying, I have a plan of peace. And people are going to be so mad about it. They're going to fight me, and they're going to create violence for you and problems for you because you are going to offer them the peace that only you can give. That's what Matthew is teaching.
My wife is an amazing entrepreneur, and uh, she designs and orchestrates and supervises the development of products basically in the craft industry, and most of them come from somewhere in Asia. And some years ago, she was working with an associate, a wonderfully gifted man, and um, in Taiwan, and uh, not a Christian, but through many, many late night conversations discussing products and things like that, they would, and she would introduce the gospel. Finally, one night, he's like, no, I'm, they, he didn't pronounce his L very well. And so he, I win, I win. My wife's name is Eileen. I win. It's peace. It's peace. All gone. All words are gone in my head. He had peace. Immediate peace. He was faithful accepting what Jesus had done for him. And I haven't been a pastor. I've been served in a couple recovery ministries. Oh, man. Talk about some rock and sockum testimonies. And the peace that people experience when they've been led to move out of those drugs and move away from that and move away from this and securely receive the salvation and then the peace for them. It's incredible. Back in the late 1800s, the world was changing greatly. The Industrial Revolution had been going on for a generation or more, and the acquisition of new forms of power and industrial design and might, and the urban centers were just growing. There was some amazing growth in our country and abroad, but because of the shift of the agrarian culture of people moving from farms into the city, they're compressed tightly into areas, and there's a lot of people with not much in tiny places. And life was tough. They weren't isolated. They didn't have much and violence, alcohol and drugs and prostitution and all kinds of other gang mafia type things began to grow and it was really dark. And a lot of people were trying to change that. And one enterprising woman said, what can I do? I mean, if people would just be nicer, what could I do to help people just be nicer? You know, we need some nice here. Good grief. So she started to speak about how to treat people nicely. And then she was hired by a paper, and she began to write a column once a week about how to be nice. Kind of helpful, you know? And she got a platform, and she was speaking and became famous, and she ended up writing a book. Emily Post wrote a book of etiquette. You ever looked at one of these? This is wild. I mean, there's, if you want to know how to write the perfect invitation, set the good table, have a nice party. To, I mean, I, it, it is hotel, guests, different types of gatherings, how to answer people, how to inquire. All about helping people. Be nice. Not a bad idea. There's not a doggone thing in here about gracious people. He was people then. And he wrote of it, and you can see it and live that every single day if you make the decision that I did 34 years ago. You can do that with me right after this. Or maybe you're sitting here today, and, man, it's tough in my house. My marriage is having a tough time. I got a health issue. My aged mom, I've got a brother who's I, Yeah, I need some. And if you tap into truth, I would suggest after you receive salvation, that reservoir of peace can come and invade, yes, even those who are not.
I have a feeling there's a couple of you today that probably skipped over that greeting. And I hope you never skip over it again. I have underlined that phrase in every epistle in my life. Paul saw it as a total, it, it is. It changed my life, it changed my eternity, it changes yours. And I bet, you know what, I wonder, do you think there's people right out here who aren't here today that could use some of that? And they might not unless you share it with them. And encourage them. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. Father, I thank you. I thank you for securing for us that peace through the broken and crushed body of your son, and yet this simple but profound yes gift. Thank you, Father, for these words that breathe life into this body today, that they would know these words and move upon them with the strength and grace that you provide and share the peace offered and secured in their hearts to others as well. 